Good morning, everyone. Welcome back from the break. My name is Nick Sly. I'm the Denver Branch Executive for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. So I serve as Nate's counterpart here in Denver. I'm, served, I'm pleased to serve as the moderator for our fourth session, Environmental Linkages. In this final session of the, of the program today, uh, we're going to discuss linkages between environmental conditions and agricultural productivity and some of the implications that that connections will have for food security. Now, similar to previous sessions, we'll start with the speaker and set the stage and share some findings from research on their topic, and then we'll follow with the discussant and then two industry panelists. Now, first, we're going to have a, our final polling question for the symposium, and a reminder that uh, Nate will discuss the uh, responses to all the polling questions during the concluding remarks following the session. So for this polling session, in your current location, could you tell us what is the most prevalent environmental risk that you see to agricultural production that you're facing? It could be drought or water availability. Uh, rather than availability, it may be water quality, but also soil quality or flooding. Another option is, another option is extreme or highly variable weather events. And then finally, an other. Now, particularly if you answer other, could you use the submit a question or comment link to provide some of that context for what that uh, what you have as, as other, what, why you responded other. But of course, we'll take context for the rest of the responses as well, so that it helps inform our thinking. Now remember that all symposium materials for this, uh, this session, as well as all sessions, uh, included with bios, speaker presentations, the papers, and all the supporting materials are available on the symposium webpage. And you can find the link by clicking, uh, clicking the resource tab uh, on your screen. Our first speaker for this session is Wolfram Schlenker. Wolfram is a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs and the Earth Institute at Columbia University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He studies the effect of weather and climate on agricultural yields and migration patterns, how climate trends and U.S. biofuel mandates have affected agricultural and commodity prices, and how pollution affects both agricultural yields uh, and human morbidity. His recent work examines how financial markets price in the changing climate conditions and the effects of carbon tax on consumer and producer prices. So with that, Wolfram, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nick, for the introduction. And thank you, for uh, Nathan, for having me part of this symposium. Uh, it's been very informative listening in on the uh, last three sessions. Uh, I know I'm talking to farmers and telling them that the weather matters for the agricultural production is kind of uh, uh, self-evident. So what I'm trying to do today is sort of focus on two particular things that I think have a key effect on agricultural productivity, and that's basically extreme uh, temperatures as well as uh, ozone pollution. And I'm going to try to show you how those uh, have evolved over the last uh, uh, 40 years and how they predicted to evolve going forward into the future. So this sort of follows up on the first session we had yesterday, where Phil sort of talked about uh, you know productivity. I'm showing you here again a time series of corn yields. Uh, that we had in the United States uh, since 1866. So you see sort of uh, uh, this very clear sort of uh, hockey stick where the yield, the output per acre that you get, the bushels per acre, has been pretty flat before 1940. Then we have the Green Revolution, and Julie, one of the panelists, can talk much more about this. And since then, we have this very impressive upward trend. But what you also see is, what you basically see here and as a solid line is the trend, but you also see the fluctuations around this trend, that's the dashed line. And you see that the environmental conditions, specifically weather, is still very important. You see, for example, uh, 2012, uh, which is sort of the big drop we see at the later part of the series. Uh, so one thing you've seen yesterday too is that it's sometimes easier not to do this in sort of absolute numbers, but in, 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 in percent terms. So on the right axis here in blue, this is just done in logs, but basically all what logs does is it basically shows you then the deviations, not in bushels per acre, but in percent terms. And so what's important here to note is sort of the percent fluctuations that we've seen in like the 1900s around this trend line aren't actually that different from the percent fluctuations that we see nowadays in the 2000s. So it basically means that while we've made huge progress in average yields, the sensitivity to sort of those fluctuations hasn't really changed that much over the last 150 years. And another thing to note here is sort of the breaking up the data uh, roughly here into three periods. Again, the flat period between sort of, sort of 1940 
Then there was almost exponential growth until roughly 1980. And then since then, while the yields are still very strongly going up, they're not growing exponentially anymore. That's what I sort of see in the blue line. And exponential growth would be linear on the, in the blue line, but it sort of started to sort of decrease in, in productivity growth. Phil alluded to that yesterday as well. And, uh, and there's sort of some question that environmental uh, factors sort of contribute to those limiting factors or what might be that. The other thing you see here is three years that are marked that I'm gonna come back to later. Uh, 1936 is sort of right after the Dust Bowl. Uh, 1988 was a hot year, and in 2012 again is the big reduction we had. Uh, uh, it was pretty hot in the United States. So I wanted to sort of highlight that there are three key factors uh, 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 that sort of come out of a regression analysis that we sort of do using very detailed data. The first one is this effect of temperatures on corn yields, and it's actually roughly approximately piecewise linear. So you see this red line. It basically tells you the effect of a 24 hour exposure on what happens to your yield at the end of the season. And so between roughly 50 degrees and around 86 degree Fahrenheit, this thing is increasing. Basically as it gets warmer, your yield is actually getting better. But then you see suddenly that after you pass 86, there's this very sharp decline that happens for temperatures that exceed 86 degree Fahrenheit in this red line. And this is sort of what's captured by the concept of degree days, which basically measure how much and for how long you're above this threshold of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, to be clear how strong this effect is, if you, for example, think about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, you have 24 hour exposure to that. And you shift this to the right side to about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. A 24 hour exposure shift from 86 Fahrenheit to 105 gives you about a 6% reduction in your annual yields at the end of the year. Now, you hardly ever get 24 hours at 105 degrees because it's only a fraction of the day and we count fraction of the day. You basically don't just uh, calculate it uh, uh, you don't classify it entirely, only the fraction of it. But those, those high temperatures have very detrimental effect on, on crop yields. Another one is actually ozone. So the, you know, the standard for the United States for ozone is 70 parts per billion. Uh, one thing you note here is a sort of another uh, regression analysis where you look at the fluctuation year to year uh, in a county's yield and link that to sort of the ozone exposure on a very fine scale. And you find again how the peak levels are really crucial. Here it's basically fixing it at the standard of 70 parts per billion. You see a pretty strong decline of higher pollution levels that basically harm the crop. Here the corn crop again. And finally I'm putting in precipitation. Now, this is not the effect of a, a you know, 24 hour exposure. This is basically the season total. And it has an effect too, but uh, it is sort of muted by the uh, uh, temperature and ozone effect. Now, a lot of people will tell you that drought is a very important thing, but drought is a relative concept. It's basically a water deficit based on the plant's demand, which depends on temperature and the water it gets. So we can have drought conditions, even though the amount of precipitation stays constant, just because temperatures are going up because the plants want more water. So in that sense, temperature and trout are sort of related. So just to highlight again, this concept of extremes. So when we do those uh, fine scale uh, regression analysis, we are basically have uh, uh, data on a two and a half by two and a half mile width for the entire United States. And we link that to yield outcomes. And the one variable that's sort of the strongest predictor for the whole United States is this degree of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So it measures how long and how much you exceed the threshold of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have one day of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be four above, it would be the same as being four days at 87 degrees Fahrenheit, which is one above. So it's basically this blue area, which is the amount of time and how much you spend above the bound. This is a, a sort of the concept of degree days. And similarly for peak ozone, it's anything where you're above 70 parts per billion and you completely disregard what's below. So going back to the temperature, if you were to disregard all temperature fluctuation below 86 degree Fahrenheit and only focus about how long and how much you're above 86, you can explain more than half of the year to year variability in corn yields. It's the strongest predictor we find. And uh, in yesterday's section on, on uh, you know, technology, people were talking about new uh, data that's available. So, you know, this is publicly available data. You can get satellite scans since 2008 on a 30 by 30 meter for the entire United States. So they tell you what crops being grown. 
So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to now show you how those environmental factors that I've focused on have evolved over time. And I'm purposely going to keep the area over which I construct the weather constant. So basically what that means is that the change in weather is not due to the fact that uh, the growing area has shifted. So you might remember Phil mentioned this yesterday too. Corn, for example, is migrated northward. I purposely for the remaining slides keep the growing area fixed using those average weights from like 2008 to uh, 2010 to 2018. And so any change you see is due to the weather or the environmental conditions that were experienced, not to a change in the growing area. And so the first thing to note here is, and this is sort of important, is that the average often doesn't tell you the full story. So you see two lines here over time. Again, the dashed line is the actual outcome year to year, the fluctuations. And this is again, the weighted average over the entire United States. It basically looks at this 30 by 30 meter grid, constructs weather and ozone on this fine detailed grid, then uses the amount of acreage in that grid and then aggregates it for the United, entire United States, the contiguous United States to basically come up with this aggregate measure. So you see the red line on the top, which is average ozone. And you see how this has hardly budged. It's been fairly constant actually since 1980 to 2019. You've seen a very small decline in the average, uh, but overall it's sort of fluctuating around a pretty similar average. Now on the right in blue, what you see is again this peak exposure, which is basically how much ozone ex exceeds 70 parts per billion. And again, 70 parts per billion is the sort of standard that EPA now has. It's not on an hourly basis, so it's basically on this eight hour maximum daily average. But for now, let's just focus on the hourly exceedance above 70 parts per billion. And so you see that in the 1980s, there was quite a bit of uh, uh, ozone. And this is basically in 100 parts per billion hours, you see in the right. So it used to be around like, uh, you know, 3,600 uh, 3, parts per billion hours. And we're basically now down to almost uh, at zero. So in that sense, the Clean Air Act actually was very sufficient in getting rid of the peak exposure. And that's sort of what uh, uh, people were most worried about for human health. But it actually has a strong impact on plant growth as well. On the other hand, we can also look at temperature as well. So here uh, you see on the in the red against the average, the red is the average temperature over the April through uh, September, uh, using again those weights from the where corn is grown. You see the fluctuations around this uh, solid trend line. Uh, you see the warm years, 1936, 1988, and 2012 in it. And you see that there's sort of a slight uptick since 1980. That's the red line. The blue line is basically, again, the extreme measure, which is degree days above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, again, that disregards all temperatures below 86 and just focuses on this exposure to extreme heat. And one thing that immediately becomes apparent here is the dust bowl years. 1934 and 1936 are the two hottest on ever that we have on record. Uh, you see in the red line, you know, that it it was warm, but it wasn't that unusually warm. There's other years where it's sort of similar averages. But what's really unique about the dust bowl years is that we had a lot of this extreme heat that's just a super detrimental uh, for crop growth. Uh, you also see 2012, uh, extreme heat, again, is a bit higher than normal, uh, the blue uh, dashed line. But uh, uh, we're still sort of, you know, uh, uh, way below what was in the dust bowl years. And the dust bowl use obviously led to a lot of uh, out migration out of agricultural areas. Now, what you see in the lighter uh, lines in magenta uh, uh, for average temperature and in, in uh, cayenne for like uh, the degree days above 86, the extreme heat measure, you see basically predictions on the climate models. And there's two things to note. Uh, the first obviously is it's predicted to get warmer. Uh, so what you see here is two scenarios, RCP 4.5 is an extra 4.5 watt per meter sphere, and RCP 8.5 is basically the fast warming scenario. Uh, some call it business as usual, but it basically means continued very fast uh, uh, warming. Now, two things to notice here, if you look at the extreme heat measure, it's just going to skyrocket out of like uh, uh, basically a determinant that we uh, out of a support that we really haven't seen in the past. So basically 2012 is supposed to be pretty soon supposed to be a normal year in terms of extreme heat exposure. So that's sort of a, a pretty worrisome if you believe in this uh, harmful effect of extreme heat. 
Now you should, should also acknowledge, if you look at the overlap, so these climate models are basically run since 1950, you see that they see an increase in those temperatures, but you also see that the realized data between 1980 and 2020 doesn't actually bear out the increase that is predicted in those models yet. And there's a bit of a discussion for why that's actually not happening. And one thing, one, uh, a couple of new papers actually argue that it's sort of a feedback loop that's currently happening where increased irrigation and crop change coverage actually has a bit of a cooling effect and that sort of compensates this natural like increase in temperature that sort of uh, basically limits it or the additional use of uh, irrigation. Some of you might remember, you know, when you go out to the dinner and they want to cool it down in Phoenix, Arizona, they have those sprinklers on to get evaporation cooling. So that's basically similar uh, in agriculture. So yes, so temperatures are really predicted to increase, uh, but we haven't really seen it as much uh, as they were. Now you might say, oh, well, are those climate models any good? So Nick mentioned this at the beginning. So another paper we have, uh, we basically looked at uh, uh, weather futures at the Chicago uh, 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 CME. And what we find there is it's another weather product. It's not really extreme heat because it's not 86 degree Fahrenheit. There the baseline is 65 degree Fahrenheit. But if you look at the trends in the models and the trends that you get in the futures prices and the trends that we get at the weather stations, they're basically all the same. So the weather models are pretty good at predicting the average warming we've seen in sort of cities in the United States. They're actually dead on. Those lines really closely overlap and the financial markets are already pricing them in, those increasing temperatures. So for example, you know, it's $1,000 more for a June cooling degree day contract in 2020 than it was in 2000. So if you, uh, you know, the market's really itching up there, but there is sort of this exception in the, in the Midwest, uh, that we have in the United States. This is basically another example showing that this basically plots, uh, the, the trend in now average temperature, not again extreme heat, but still it, it plots it for like uh, growing areas around the globe. And you do see how there's sort of this, uh, exceptional uh, area in the, in the corn belt in the Midwest. We you see blue, so this is in terms of uh, standard deviation, meaning year to year fluctuations uh, that a place uh, uh, has observed in the past and what the trend is. You see how Europe has warmed a lot. So they are all a very strong drying and also warming. You also see this in places in India and in a lot of China, but the United States hasn't seen so much warming yet. So following up on Sergio's talk today, who talked about total, product, uh, total factor productivity, uh, as a paper just came out this year, uh, that doesn't just look at yields, you know, which is just one output, but also looks at, you know, factor productivity as the difference between, as Sergio explained, between how much you get out minus how much you put in. And so what they do is they basically look at those observed uh, uh, trends that I just showed you in the previous graph all around the globe. And then they link that to sort of the effect this has on, on yields, those weather variables. And then they'll basically examine the effect of the observed trend on total for the uh, factor productivity. So you see it in the United States, it's not that large. It's only at a small degrees. It's like in, in the yellowish area, part mostly because it hasn't warmed that much. But usually you have other places, for example, in Africa, uh, have seen a very dramatic reduction in total factor productivity due to the observed uh, weather trend compared to what it would have uh, uh, expected to have had uh, without the observed warming trend. So what are the implications of that? So let me try to wrap up on this with sort of contrasting what we've seen in the past and what we uh, as predicted to see in the future. So, you know, the United States is one of the uh, uh, bread baskets of the world. There's four basic commodities, corn, wheat, rice, and soybeans that together account roughly for 75% of calories that humans consume. That includes the indirect amount of calories that are being produced by basically as using it as a feedstock. Uh, the US market share, it's slightly gone down, but it's around 25%. So it's like the biggest player by far in the calorie market. Uh, it's bigger than, for example, Saudi Arabia is in oil, and we always think about it's being such an important country. So it, it's just a, a really strong uh, 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 a production center. So one thing going forward that we basically see is that extreme yield uh, will most likely add another drag on the productivity growth, uh, given all the sort of empirical studies we have 
showing the detrimental effect it has on yields. So 2012, again, is sort of the prime example. 2012, the model was fitting right on. If you just plug in this degree is above 86 and you look at a 20% yield shortfall we had in, in corn in 2012, it's completely predicted by this extra warm year we had. Now, under climate models, we're supposed to see much more of this. Again, a bit of a warning. There's a, currently a bit of a feedback loop, which seems to limit the amount of warming. But uh, talking, I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, but talking with them, they really don't think that this can continue for like the entire century, that you use more and more irrigation water to sort of limit the eventual uh, uh, uptick of this extreme heat measure. Uh, another thing that has been beneficial in the part, well, past was the elimination of peak ozone, which really increased uh, yields quite a, quite a bit. I like uh, uh, that's actually responsible for a significant share of, of the observed yield trend. And then obviously uh, CO2 fertilization was also and add a little bit up, uh, uh, add to an increase in the productivity growth. It's like another input you get. So what is the implication then of that? Well, given the market share of the United States, this most likely would uh, lead to an increase on the price of basic food commodities if the U.S. is sort of seeing a decrease in yields. It might initially be good for uh, 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 for farmers since they get higher prices, but uh, it might be de definitely detrimental. And this is sort of the keynote from this morning on, on people who basically have a hard time feeding themselves because the calorie, uh, uh, the costs become too prohibitive. The other thing it might see is uh, most likely a regional shift. So we've seen, as again, Phil mentioned yesterday, corn's moving northward. You might see more and more of this, that we sort of see a, a, a shift, especially also towards northern Russia. The New York Times had a big story there about how this might actually uh, uh, be the new sort of pet basket of the future. So let me conclude here since I'm about to run out of time. So in the past, we've basically seen that this extreme heat measure has sort of led to a huge, uh, after the dust bowl, to huge outmigration. You obviously should argue that today is very different from the 1930s, but still we haven't seen any year close to what we had in the 1930s. We might see more of that in the future, though, and linking those kind of uh, agricultural, uh, you know, extreme heat measures to yields and migration. We do find in other settings, too, for example, that in West Africa, uh, when yields go south, we see much more migration within West Africa. Peep farmers abandon their fields and leave. We see a spike in, in sort of asylum application in Europe. So there's huge repercussions throughout the world. Thank you for your uh, for listening. Well, from, thanks for getting us started in the final session for the symposium today. Our discussant is uh, William Martin. So Will Martin is a senior research fellow at the International Food and Policy Research Institute and is the immediate past president of the International Association of Agricultural Economists. Now, his recent research focused primarily on the impacts of shocks such as price changes, uh, food policy reforms, COVID-19 and some of the other macroeconomic shocks and how they affect poverty and food security in developing countries. Now, his research has also examined the impacts of major trade policy reforms, including uh, books he's written on the Uruguay Round, Doha, uh, the Doha Development Agenda, and China's Ascension to the WTO. So, Will, I'm very thankful to have you as the discussant for this paper, for this session. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank Wolfram <clears throat> for um, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, Nate has asked me to focus uh, on the socioeconomic uh, impacts, um, but I'd first like to thank Wolfram for the excellent work that he shared with us. Um, Wolfram uh, is a true scientist, thoughtful, measured, careful. His work is very concrete um, and careful in the analysis, as we've seen um, today. Um, I'm very glad that he focused um, on corn yields uh, in, in this particular paper. As economists, we, we tend to think um, of productivity growth, total factor productivity being the most important um, variable, but it's rather less tangible um, than, than yields. Um, and the other particular complication that emerges when we're talking about agricultural productivity growth, um, is that 
productivity growth is typically biased um, strongly, especially the green revolution type of productivity growth, which has given us such enormous um, improvements in the world economy, um, is very strongly biased. There's a lot of labor saving, there's a lot of land saving, there's often um, capital and intermediate inputs you're using. Uh, and that can lead to very serious complications with TFE measures. And they can appear while the um, productivity is patently growing, TFP um, may not uh, perform because um, the products that are with large shares are, are growing quite rapidly as inputs. Um, so uh, I think yield, the tangibility factor is important um, and it complements work done using total factor productivity very importantly. I really like the way Wolfram presents both the, the good um, and the bad. The emphasis he gave to the cooling um, that he highlighted over the Corn Belt, the U.S. Corn Belt, and the particular nature of that reprieve from rising temperatures. While the U.S. temperatures are rising, the particular temperature measure that he uses um, has not been rising as yet. Uh, but he raises the concern from climate scientists that this is likely to be a temporary reprieve. Another thing I really liked uh, in the paper is the emphasis on the, the ground level ozone, the implications of changes in the concentration of ground level ozone um, for yields. That's a very important determinant um, whose influence is very rarely explored. And I thought that was a very important contribution, not only analytically, but also for providing an example of where well considered policies um, can have very, very favourable uh, impacts. Um, I think there's a risk of excessive pessimism in this area, and it's very good to have an example of where something um, had a policy implication, a, a policy action that had very favourable uh, impacts. And he raises the concern, the very serious concern, that if this keeps going, um, then the, the rising temperature trend, however, um, that we're likely to see um, some very serious impacts on productivity. The impacts of the rising temperatures, he notes, lower yields, that's the primary concern, um, but also lower worker productivity. Now, that's important in the US and be much more important in developing countries, especially countries like India and Africa, where the initial temperatures are already higher um, and that impact on productivity is important. Wolfram's paper draws out a number of implications, um, socioeconomic implications, the need for adaptation, adaptation and change, for migration, um, for sectoral reallocation, and the possibility um, of higher food prices. These are hugely important, um, and I think I'd like to emphasise that they're going to be much more important in countries other than the United States. Within the United States, there's already been enormous migration of agriculture. Agriculture has moved west. Um, the Corn Belt, as uh, Phil Party has shown in earlier work, has moved north, substantially moved, moved further north. Now, of course, in the US and Canada, um, there's a lot of potential um, for doing that. I think what we have to worry about greatly is in those countries where the temperatures are initially higher and where there really isn't the same scope for dealing with rising temperatures um, by migration um, <clears throat> uh, within the available uh, geographic area. Agricultural productivity growth, the focus of Wolfram's work, um, was very important to remember um, that this is kryptonite for poverty reduction. If nothing else changes, if we're dealing with a small open economy and agricultural productivity rises, it raises the incomes of farmers. In developing countries, farmers are typically the poorest. Um, it's probably still the case that the majority of the world's poor um, are farmers um, who depend on farming for their income. Rising productivity helps them very directly. When you have widespread improvements in agricultural productivity, as we've seen with the Green Revolution, um, food prices fall. And that 
is perhaps an even bigger contributor to poverty reduction. Because remember that the people who spend the most, the biggest share of their income uh, on basic food are the poorest people. Poor people spend up to 70, 80 percent of their income on food. If you have rising agricultural productivity that pushes down uh, prices, that lowers the cost of living for the poor, doesn't lower the cost of living for the rich um, very much in percentage terms, but it lowers the cost of living for the poor by a large amount. Um, <clears throat> and that is where you can get massive reductions uh, in, in poverty. The other thing that rising agricultural productivity does is to set in train a process of structural transformation where people like me um, leave the farm and move to other activities. Um, that That is a long process of adjustment in, in, in all economies. Countries start off, the poorest countries start off with about 80% of the workforce in agriculture and still um, on the verge of, of starvation. Once you um, uh, get to um, a situation where um, you have a, a tiny fraction of the, of the population in the workforce, a situation like uh, the United States with around 1% of the workforce in agriculture still able to produce more food than it needs um, for its own consumption. Um, Recent work by Doug Gollan and others shows that this process of transformation also provides an enormous benefit by removing the Malthusian sword of Damocles, by reducing um, birth rates from, and, and uh, enabling um, a slowdown in the ballistic rates of population growth that have threatened um, human welfare um, uh, f uh, throughout the transformation process. So falling agricultural productivity coming from rising temperatures threatened to reverse that process um, and to unwind much of the progress that we've made in lowering poverty, in raising incomes, in helping countries um, uh, develop. And this process can be very serious. We do see it from time to time in parts of Africa where you see a reversal, where you see um, more labor needed in agriculture. And agriculture in most developing economies has much lower productivity than manufacture. So you can see a reversal process with very, very damaging consequences um, for uh, socioeconomic, for economic development uh, and, and for poverty reduction. Uh, so this is absolutely critical um, for the welfare of the poor of the world going forward for all people. The, the example that Wolfram has provided of the impacts on the United States is a salutary warning and one um, that we must take uh, enormously seriously. We're going to have to do a lot um, to increase research and development, to put more resources in to try to counteract uh, these adverse impacts. Um, this is a very, very serious challenge and one that's going to need a great deal of attention. My time's up. Um, thank you again, Wolfram, for an excellent presentation. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. <laughs> Mr. Martin, thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate you contextualizing some of the research that we saw from uh, Mr. Schlenker earlier in the session. I uh, appreciate your comments. I'm pleased to introduce our first industry panelist uh, for the final session today. Uh, I'm, please welcome uh, Julie Borlaug uh, to the virtual stage. Uh, Julie is Vice President for External Relations for Inor Inari Ag a uh, biotech seed company. Now, prior to joining Inari, she served as Associate Director uh, for External Affairs at the Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture, as well as for strategic initiatives for corporate relations at Texas A&M, uh, the AgriLife Ag Agri Research Group. So, Julie, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm fortunate that I come to agriculture genetically. Um, through my grandfather, but I'm also fortunate that I've gotten to see the U.S. side of agriculture as well as the international side and mainly focusing on developing regions such as Africa, um, South America, 
Asia, spent a lot of time in India. So I get to kind of see a um, holistic view of how climate change, pollution, and um, other challenges we face affects food security. So I just kind of wanted to highlight food security and, and how all of this affects it because um, the two gentlemen before me have done a wonderful job explaining a lot of um, the facts of climate change and um, how it affects agricultural productivity. And for anybody who doesn't um, believe there's climate change, please come and live in Dallas, Texas. Um, it has rained for 12 days straight. We are in late May. Um, in February, we had one of the coldest winters, and we have a um, seven-day cold snap uh, where the city was shut down, and we lost our power grid in Texas. And in October, we now have tornadoes. So that alone, you don't have to be a farmer to see the effects of climate change and to understand that erratic weather patterns not only affect farmers, but affect all of our lives. Uh, if you look at what's going on, especially within all of the um, conversations and conferences that we're having about sustainability and um, agriculture and food security, um, I'm fortunate to be on the UN Food Systems Champion um, Champions Committee, and I'm also on the U.S. Food Systems response to the UN Food System Committee. And you'll hear the same things over and over, and that's sustainability, climate change, holistic systems approach needed for innovation. And of course, we always talk about food security because that is the overarching thing that is going to be affected by all of this. So when you think about food security, it is dependent on sustainability, climate, and innovation, and pollution and the causes of these things. Um, when I talk a lot about this, I talk about um, incentives. How can we incentivize farmers or any of us in the ag industry or anything that affects the ag industry, so that is mining and everything else that changes the air quality and, and pollution? Um, how do we incentivize people to do better? We have a lot of farmers, and I'm going to speak for the farmers, and thank you to all the farmers who are here today. Um, you make this possible, and you're the only reason why we're here, so thank you. But um, we have farmers who have been doing this right for a long time, and um, we are now trying to incentivize others to join these farmers, whether it's no-till or cover crops or anything like that, to have a more sustainable approach um, to agriculture. So I think we have to expand how we incentivize the industry and all those that are affecting the industry. If you look at how they're, we're trying to set up carbon markets and carbon sequestrations and how that will affect um, farming and all these changes, it, 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 I kind of call it the Dogecoin of agriculture right now. It's kind of the Wild West as this market is trying to come together and figure out what is going on. And I've been studying it and it's really interesting. But you can't just start incentivizing farmers who are now going to use no-till and all of these other things that give them credits towards it. You have to talk about additionality. How do we go back and um, support the farmers who have been doing this for so long? And if you look at um, Bayer, their carbon market system will support farmers who have been doing this from 2012. So how can we take these types of programs that are in Europe, Europe or the United States and take those to Africa, take those to India and other areas and incentivize those who haven't joined um, to become a part of the solution. We also talk about support system approaches and you can call this more of a holistic approach. So everyone along the value chain in agriculture. So that can be agriculture, you know, within my grandfather's green revolution, it was all about increasing calories. There wasn't really a nutritional um, component. Now we know we have to have nutrition. So when we talk about increasing productivity and yields, we have to talk about nutrition as well. And we have to talk about um, how all the life sciences are going to affect agriculture, how infrastructure, we need roads, we need um, irrigation, we need all of this. So when we talk about changing food security or changing climate change, it has to be holistic conversation and a holistic number of people involved in organizations and the solutions. I'm not going to get into this because um, the Federal Reserve um, can talk about this better than I can, but regulatory, regulatory, regulatory. We need to make sure we have regulatory that's safe and effective, that's comprehensible. I think we've, lo we've learned a lot from what um, COVID has done and what you can do quickly in creating a vaccination, whether it was Moderna, Pfizer, or the others. So maybe we need to look at that within agriculture. But one thing about regulatory, if we, and I'm speaking to the farmers here right now, if 
people don't understand what you do, that they don't understand you are the biggest environmentalist there is, your soil is the most important thing you have, then the public will hear other stories that farmers are abusing their soil and so forth and so on. So we need to make sure that we have a voice and we're speaking because that directly affects the regulations that are going to be put upon you. Um, also, we can't do this without talking about women, especially in food security. We have the majority of farming done in developing countries is done by women. They are the ones feeding their families. We must bring women along. Youth and agriculture. I'm a huge component for youth and agriculture. 2050 is going to be their problem, and they're going to have to find the solutions. So let's bring them to the table. Let's have them sit down and tell us their out-of-box ideas. They don't look at this challenge and say, how are we going to do this? They don't go back and talk about the 1930s or the past. They talk about how can we use innovation and technology and all these other different systems to really make a difference? Because this is a um, generation that wants to see change for the better. So we need to embrace them and bring them to the table. And the other thing I'd like to add is I do a lot of communications in agriculture. And um, I would say we haven't been the best in advocating for ourselves or talking to those who might oppose. So you might be pro um, gene editing, you might be pro um, innovation and research and um, technology, or you might want to be on organic system. And what I have to say is that is fine. We accept all of that. We need every solution in um, the toolbox, but we need to all speak with one voice on behalf of those that are hungry and malnourished and need to be fed. So let's come together, find solutions. Let's support each other's different solutions, but let's come together. When you think about a public that 80% don't think there's DNA in our food, how do we bring them along in areas um, like gene editing and um, other um, really advanced research? We have to figure out a way to talk to them. Um, when I was going through this paper, and um, talking to people about, do you see a connection between my poor family and friends are guinea pigs for me? But when I asked them, do you see a connection between pollution and agricultural pro productivity? They understood nothing what I was talking about. They didn't realize air quality and having better sunlight um, on your crops actually increased the yield. So we have to have those conversations. Um, when you talk about regional shifts and how this is going to affect especially within the United States, how this is going to affect farming. And um, as farming moves farther up north, we could lose a lot to Canada. So that's talking about our own economy and um, jobs and everything. So we need to make everyone understand that this doesn't affect just food security and agriculture. This affects a holistic um, environment. Um, and um, I also like to explain that, you know, we, we talked about how drought isn't exactly um, related to um, climate change in the way a lot of people think or heat, but drought um, is a cycle that's getting longer and longer. And you can speak to the farmers in East Africa who can tell you that they've seen this in the last 10, 15, 20 years. They've been aware of climate change long before we were accepting it or really noting it and looking for solutions. And there is a direct linkage between extreme weather, drought, wildflower, wildfires and pests. And you have to explain that sometimes to the public because they don't understand that. But it's a great if you use the story of the locusts in Kenya and what's that done. If we have higher temperatures, we have more pests. How do we solve for that? We don't want to put more insecticide and pesticides down. So how do we solve for that? Is something like gene editing a way that we can solve around that? So we have to look at everything holistically. Um, another big thing that I believe will help with food security is access to data. We have to make sure smallholder farmers here in the United States, but especially in developing countries, and I'm going to go back to Kenya because that's one of my uh, passions and an area I spent a lot of time in. Those farmers need access to field conditions, where they should um, plant, where they shouldn't plant, when they should plant, when the rain's coming, um, if they can get drought notifications, all of that. And we have to set them up so they have the same access. And our smallholder farmers here in the United States need that access as well. And we also have to figure out how we scale this to our smallholder farmers here and those in developing countries so that they can um, benefit from all the innovation and research. And um, one of my biggest concerns is 
acceptance to innovation. And that goes back to communication. And I do believe our farmers are the best way we can change this conversation, but all of us have to change the conversation. Because when we talk about access to innovation and um, technology and the need for increased R&D and increased federal spending for R&D, we have to understand that we're just not talking about how this affects our farming incomes. This is how we affect the food that's available, the quality food that's available on our shelves. So I'm going to stop there. That was a lot, but thank you for having me. Sporlike, thank you very much for your discussion. I look forward to coming back to you as we move to the Q&A, but we have one panelist left. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gabe Guzmini. Uh, Gabe is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Plant Pathways Company Incorporated. This is a startup plant breeding company focused on improving underserved crops where the added value comes mostly from target metabolites. Gabe has more than 20 years of, of experience in global organizations and launching both commercial seed varieties, um, and he's previously held research and developing leadership positions at PepsiCo uh, and Syngenta. So Gabe, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good morning, everybody. Very happy to be here. Um, I think that after the, the very interesting talks that we just heard, I can, I can bring some very tangible examples of how what was discussed just, just now in, in terms of uh, uh, core movements or changes in uh, technology and technology acceptance and how all of that can come together for other crops. Uh, can have a very significant impact on, on food and supply chain continuity and security. So the first example I would like to talk about comes from my time at PepsiCo. Um, as you might know, or for sure know, PepsiCo owns uh, uh, the Quaker Oats company brand, uh, which is the largest uh, oat company in the world. Um, and the majority of, of their uh, business is in North America. Oats uh, have been produced for, for the majority in the, uh, all the way up to the 1980s in the upper Midwest, between North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, a little bit of spillage into Illinois and, and so on. Uh, when corn started moving north and west, as Phil explained yesterday, that put a lot of pressure based on body of the crop to, to farmers onto land availability and ended up pushing uh, the crop up into the prairies in, uh, in, in southern Canada, so Manitoba and, and Saskatchewan in particular. I would say in a boundary of about 100 miles north of the border. So at that time, the movement wasn't necessary that the, 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 the climate was changing, was that the crop was moving into different climates. And gave a good example of the challenges that that brought about. So the industry, the other industry, had about uh, 15 years or so to learn how to adapt to a change in production, look, such a dramatic change in production location, and what the challenge is that, that, that change in, in, in environment around the crop was posing to the crop, not just in terms of yield, but particularly in terms of nutritional quality, uh, in terms of return per acre to the farmers, and in terms of risk of discontinuity of supply chain. So then climate change came about and environmental uh, uh, conditions started changing in the prairies, uh, which became somewhat positive for the expansion further north of corn and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, um, and canola, which put additional pressure on the crop and the crop started moving eventually into northern Saskatchewan, Alberta, and in the last 10 years started into northern Alberta, which is now pushing the crop and when I say the crop, I mean the entire supply of the crop uh, into production areas that are no longer uh, fit for delivering the nutritional quality that, that this crop needs to deliver. And oat is particularly welcome in diet because of the contribution of beta-glucan and protein, uh, which have a direct effect, as you, you might know, onto human health, heart condition, and, and so forth. So the industry to adapt, so what, what, what we did was starting to think about how we could accelerate the deployment of, of technologies in plant breeding um, from more advanced uh, crops like corn and soy and vegetables and so on into rapidly improving uh, the genetics of the crop to start delivering the same quality that it was delivering when it was further south into further north uh, uh, production areas in, thinking that those production areas will continue to change 
in terms of, of rain patterns, temperature patterns, and eventually soil, soil quality and soil availability. Um, so we, we embarked into a, a deliberate strategy as an entire industry into working in joining public and private um, research efforts to accelerate the deployment of, of things like uh, computational sciences, uh, genome sequencing, uh, um, high throughput uh, uh, measurement sciences um, into, into shortening the breeding cycles of food from traditional 16, 18 years down to five to seven years so that we could start rotating innovation into the grower field as rapidly as possible to move the needle and securing the, the continuity of the supply chain. Another example of a slightly different flavor is the example of potato. Again, when I was at, Singenta, at PepsiCo, sorry, um, um, I was working on the potato crop for Frito-Lay. Uh, Frito-Lay is by far a very large consumer of, of potatoes for potato chips. Um, and uh, um, used to purchase potatoes um, all, all around the states in, in the U.S. and, and probably into Canada uh, to follow the seasonality and uh, uh, really focus on obtaining uh, crops for the different locations that can deliver the same reference quality into their finished product. So that, that, that bag of potato chips or classic lays or ruffles or whatever you like that you buy in the store always tastes the same, always looks the same, uh, always has the same texture. Um, to do that, uh, of course, that driven partly from processing technology, but in large part by the quality of the crop that gets harvested and processed in, in Frito-Lay's plants. Uh, the potato crop uh, in the last uh, 15 years or 20 years has been subjected more and more to uh, what they're called abiotic stresses, uh, driven by climate change in those production locations. Uh, so increased heat has had a very significant impact on, on quality of the crop, on processing quality of the crop. Um, increased and unpredictable uh, rain patterns has had an impact on, on actual marketability of the crop, ability of, of, of harvest the crop that can be processed to begin with, uh, and so on, many other examples along those lines. So that's the case where uh, the, the biological system of the crop um, gave us a very strong limitation on how fast that we could improve it in order to adapt to these changes. Potato is a clonal crop. You take a potato, cut in pieces, plant it, and then your potato plant grows. Uh, that's, uh, it provides some limitations to what plant breeders can do in order to improve the crop. Very significant limitations, actually. Uh, so as an industry and the public sector, um, sort of stimulated by innovation that came from a small startup in Europe, uh, started working and shifting entirely the crop from being a clonal crop to becoming a hybrid crop where you could have hybrids like in corn, plant seeds, through seeds directly in the field, uh, and essentially provide the breeders a very effective and fast method uh, for selecting, for new types of adaptation and better adaptation uh, against the backdrop of the same processing quality that's required, whether that's for potato chips for frito or for uh, tabletop assets uh, for, for uh, uh, home consumption or starch potatoes for the starch industry. That required a very concerted effort uh, by all of the players um, that had to reinvent our entire crop was bred, was multiplied, was sold to farmers, and then other farmers would grow it. And all of that needs to happen not in a you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 year cycle, it to happen within a decade. And we are now right in the middle of that decade and significant progress has been made and, and, and things are starting to fall into place. But it gives it to me a very good example of how uh, uh, rapid, very rapid change starts jeopardizing an entire industry and only a very rapid adoption of new methodologies and technologies and a reorganization of the entire value chain around, around that uh, concept can drive, can drive a, a benefit. Uh, last, uh, the example of my current company. So I left PepsiCo uh, with, uh, with a program, with a spin-off of a program that's improving stevia as a natural sweetener uh, to replace sugar. Um, we all need more calories, as we've been saying, but we need good calories and well distributed around the world. 
And stevia can contribute in that space greatly because of the flexibility of the crop, because being entirely non-caloric, and because it grows uh, um, in, in a very wide adaptation area. So now that we're sitting here thinking about our business strategies, we start to think about a crop that can truly grow in a, in a very wide adaptation area, but that that poses big questions is where are we going to focus? Where is the industry going to focus to produce the crop in a concentrated area so that we can optimize that supply chain and optimize the biology of the crop to support that supply chain? And so difficult questions come about around what's going to look like, what, what that environment is going to look like over the next 15, 20 years. So that we can start building forward rather than fixing backwards as I described in the previous two crops. Um, and the choices that we're making are around focusing on, on regions, not only where the, the climatic shift seems to be slightly more predictable, uh, but also that moving in a direction that requires more crop to be introduced in the agriculture system in order to optimize the overall use of resources. Um, as an example, the introduction of stevia into rotations in, in the southwest uh, uh, has a direct impact on the utilization of water rights by farmers in that area uh, without relying on monoculture that's not supported by other regulations for really good reasons. Um, the introduction is southeast of the U.S. as a replacement crop for, for low value or crops that have lost value, like, like tobacco, some of the cucurbit, like cucumber, and, and, and so on, and uh, um, oranges in Florida. By providing a new crop that very rapidly can be established as that flexibility of adapting to an evolving environment over time very rapidly because of its biology and can deliver a high value uh, ingredient that the industry needs. Um, at this point, I'll stop there and happy to take more questions later on during the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Gabe, thank you, and thank you to all our presenters for this uh, this session. We've already got a number of questions that have come in, but just as a reminder for everyone, uh, please use the link on your screen for the webcast uh, to submit your questions. Uh, the first question I want to put to uh, both Wolfram and Will that came in regarding uh, how to think about soil, product soil productivity and soil health when you think about measures of overall total factor productivity and yield models. Uh, Julie, I, I know you also talked about this too. The, uh, farmers caring a lot and, and be most invested stakeholders for with regard to soil health. This question I think is pointed to is how to incorporate the changes in soil health, soil health uh, when thinking about how to do uh, yield estimations. Um, and so I'm interested, Will and Wolfram, to start with you on, on um, uh, your thoughts there. Also, soil is definitely a key component in their productivity. Um, the reason why I hadn't highlighted it here is so from a statistical perspective, things that vary year to year are much easier to identify than things that sort of stay move slower or are constant. But we have ample examples like, you know, in southern Iowa, where sort of the moraines and from the last glacial expansion and soil quality changes pretty quickly how sort of productivity changes. It wasn't just part of, uh, of this uh, particular presentation. Uh, but uh, it's definitely an important factor. Now, in terms of, it doesn't change as drastically though, I think as uh, as the temperatures are predicted to rise, that's why I highlighted that. But uh, as, as Julie mentioned already, and Will can talk much more about this, it's definitely a key component of productivity as well. Just, to, to, just very briefly, um, uh, the, um, uh, it, it shows up there in productivity uh, to the extent that reductions in soil quality um, reduce reduce yields, uh, but it isn't normally measured um, directly for the reason uh, that Wolfram mentioned. Soil quality also matters a whole lot for sequestration. There can be a lot of carbon sequestered um, in soils in the same way that um, the carbon that's sequestered uh, in forests. We're better at measuring the carbon sequestration in forests, um, but this is also a, an important um, factor as far as environmental change is concerned. Thank you both. We see a couple more questions coming in here. Uh, well, from one other one that came in is, is you mentioned that temperature might not have gone uh, too high or impacted agriculture um, because of the way that farmers are irrigating their, their land and, and utilizing those resources. 
But at the same time, same time as we draw down these aquifers, uh, we may not be able to adapt in the same way that we did in the past. And so um, this is a reflection on the comments that you made, but I really open it to the whole section is, can you say something about the aquifer level decline and, and how that might be related to climate change or how it might be related to um, uh, agricultural productivity going forward? Climate change or how it might be related to um, uh, agricultural productivity going forward? Also, Richard Hornbeck has a couple of really nice papers about this. For example, the Ogagala aquifer, uh, because just because of overuse, has been sort of uh, drawn down and how it actually has been impacted in farm and values. At first, when they sort of innovated in the system, how you can use sort of, you know, uh, irrigation, new, new circle irrigation techniques, how it basically increased farm and values for the people who suddenly were available to include this new technology. But then as the stock was drawn down, the land values basically dropped again relative to sort of close by counties that are not over the aquifer. So it's a big problem and it sort of uh, goes back to what other speakers have mentioned here too. A lot of it has to do with institutional setup. Uh, aquifers are often common pool resources. So if I draw down, I basically limit it for my neighbors too. So the incentive of a farmer is not necessarily to preserve it for the next year because they are afraid that somebody else is basically sort of sucking it out. So I think there, there you need to sort of think about water markets. So some states, you know, experiment with that. And I think that can be sort of a way forward to make sure it's allocated efficiently. Gabe, I know you touched on this a bit as, as crops start to move around uh, in their production areas. I don't know if you had any comments or, or thoughts on um, the use of aquifers and availability going forward. Yeah, so certainly, um, you know, I talked about uh, potato and I talked about stevia, both crops that rely very largely on, on water and water availability and, and water quality. Um, and same as those, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, quality driven crops, um, in the vegetable space uh, are largely dependent on water and water availability. Um, so there is a direct linkage there that, that we can't forget, and it's not a linkage in some cases that has a quantitative effect. In some cases, a yes or no for the crop to be able to grow in a certain area, and we're starting to see that even now. Uh, you know, when I look at, at stevia and where we should establish the supply chain, there are areas where economically it would be very beneficial to farmers, and farmers are very interested. Uh, but there isn't enough water uh, for a crop that's very, very water dependent. Well, thank you both. Uh, I have the next question here for Julie uh, and then for Gabe here is, is really reflecting on a conversation that's evolved over the last year and, and even longer about food security uh, and it being elevated and some of the concerns that we're seeing uh, right now. So a broad version of this question is, what lessons do you think have been learned over the past year? And then maybe a bit more narrow is, uh, what are some actions or some changes and strategies that can be implemented uh, that might occur uh, really in, in the near future? Julie? Well, I think um, here in the U.S., we've learned that we can have a, uh, a food um, security issue, as we did with um, with um, COVID. And, of course, that was due to transportation and the whole supply chain. But if you look abroad, it is a lot about um, getting access to the right inputs, to the right seeds, the growing conditions, as well as here in the United States and um, in developing countries, um, post-harvest waste. So I think um, a lot of the discussion needs to go back in the United States that, yes, we can have food shortages. Just because a grocery store looks full today, it may not be. So we need to take a little more, um, I think we need to take more appreciation to what our farmers do and how intricate the entire food supply is here in the United States. Again, abroad, I think people get food security and food famines mixed up. A food famine or a famine really is more of a um, man-made, man-person um, made event where we block access or we can't get food. We have enough calories. We have enough food produced today. It's it's um, poor regulatory wars and other things that get in the way. So when we talk about food security, I really think it's making every country, every region able to grow enough food to support themselves. That does not hurt the U.S. farmer here. That actually provides more um, opportunities for the farmers to export more of their goods. So I think, again, it's making everyone locally sufficient in what they're farming and what they're able to grow. 
Yes, yeah, so building okay. off of what Julie just said in, in the last couple of sentences uh, about the ability of growing crops locally, uh, whether that locally means within a country rather than, than, than within a city or, 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 or smaller region. Uh, you know, one thing that's under uh, um, valued and has been hitting during the COVID epidemics quite strongly um, is that crops may not be ready to be grown everywhere. Um, plant breeding may have taken those crops uh, in a very focused uh, uh, range of environments where they can perform in terms of productivity and quality. Um, so a good example, I just happened to be sitting here in Canada for, for family reasons for a few weeks. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Canada has experienced a significant disruption um, in uh, availability of fruit and vegetables during the COVID epidemic. Um, and so the government had a my, my opinion, brilliant idea of starting to reinvest in activating uh, protected crop production for, for crops that can grow naturally in, in the Canadian prairies. Uh, but uh, they are now hitting a, a major, major roadblock because that doesn't just mean building new greenhouses that are sustainable and efficient, doesn't mean just automation. Uh, it also means finding the genetics that can grow. In a, in a protected environment. And, and in some cases, they do exist. Uh, in some other cases, for very important crops, they just don't exist anymore because they are not grown in protected environments anywhere else in the world anymore. And so to me, there is a need. Uh, so, you, you know, the lesson learned is that we need to, to start thinking about all of the different uh, aspects of a crop adaptation that we're going to need in the future and have them to some level and stages of development in our arsenal, then when we need to deploy, then we are one or two years away from being able to do that, rather than you know 20 or 30 like we might be in some situations now. Well, thank you, Gabe. And Will, did you want to add to this discussion as well? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think the COVID epidemic highlighted something we've known for a while about food insecurity, which is that it's mostly due to access constraints on, on food, rather, people not having access to food rather than there being insufficient food. As Julie mentioned, we, we produce enough calories worldwide. It's, it's getting them um, to, to the people. Um, and I think the, the COVID epidemic is really a nice illustration uh, of that phenomenon. This is not like the 1918 influenza pandemic, which sliced through the working age population. Uh, the morbidity rates are relatively low, but a lot of people lost income because of shutdowns, because of social isolation, um, uh, in dodges their own choices of social isolation out of concern about the disease. So um, those losses of income had enormous impacts on poverty. In work that uh, David Laborde and Rob Voss and I have done, we concluded that about 150 million people were thrown into poverty by this pandemic even though it wasn't a shock primarily, the, the shocks to food markets themselves were relatively minor. So it's access is always a, a vital criterion. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation around some of those, what are the drivers for uh, food insecurity that we're seeing now, the, the fact that it's, that it's coming home. So thank you for the comments there. Uh, and a variety of those comments, I think, dovetail nicely into the next question that came in that thought about, you know, supply chain and distribution issues, the challenge of growing the calories, but also distributing it to, to people who need it. Uh, all of you have touched partly on the concentration of crop production, crop production to different geographic areas. The question that came in is, uh, what's the impact of a warming climate on the ability to do that, uh, to, to have that greater concentration? Are you seeing a shift to some more favorable uh, geographic areas? So I give this to the whole group. Well, maybe I'll take a stab at, at one aspect of it. Um, to me, the, 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 the answer is different crop by crop. We have crops where pointing to greater concentration uh, can be beneficial for maintaining the cost and accessibility of that food low. And that's an example of small grains, where you can grow a lot of it in a small um, geographic area and transportation is relatively inexpensive because of the large amount uh, that you can pack into a ship uh, across the ocean. Um, opposite example, uh, very heavy crops, uh, again, look at potato or crops that are perishable, think about vegetables, 
where you just can't do that because of the what the crop is about. Um, and so thinking about the impact on on uh, uh, this on, on local more localized production or more distributed production, you know, environmental changes might prevent that from being possible in some countries. Um, so there is a direct uh, direct uh, uh, challenge there in starting to think very rapidly into looking into the future and the whole value chain level, uh, crop family by crop family essentially. And you could just think about it in terms of grains versus legumes versus uh, perishable crops and so on. Um, and the last comment then is, is, is the difference instead for crops where an ingredient gets extracted. Um, because that step of extraction might reduce the volume, might stabilize the, the, the quality of the deliverables into nutrition and can be distributed more globally from a centralized location. So it's a very complex uh, topic that, that to me needs to be thought and planned in a more strategic way that has been done so far. I think as Gabe made very important points about where you can grow crops. I think there's another side of the equation too, which is actually how weather is correlated across space. So we have this amazing natural hedge that usually one country gets hit, but another country has like a plentiful harvest. And so you see that overall production is actually not that much impacted. If you think about the four basic uh, color crops I mentioned earlier, like the, the overall shock globally is within plus minus 5% over the last 50 years. They're not really moving that much because shocks in one area like the US gets a 20% drop, gets sort of balanced by somebody else. Now with climate change, there's sort of two interesting areas going forward. Some people are trying to model where your optimal hedge might actually be in the future, just because how climate is correlated. And then in the climate sciences, there's an active area of research where those shocks actually become more correlated, which would actually be a huge deal because right now those shocks kind of tend to average out. If they suddenly were to become a bit more correlated, and I think the answer in that is not really fully resolved yet, you will get much wider overall swings. And that would be a, would be a big implication for storage and other things that we've seen earlier in the, in the session this morning about, you know, how much green you would actually store given that your shocks might be amplified. I think there's a very important point for policy, trade policy, that follows from Wolfram's um, uh, point there, and which is that if countries try to enforce self-sufficiency, um, make sure they only rely on domestic production, not only are they lowering their income, but they're locking themselves into a very unstable production portfolio. So it's really important that trade be available there, both to deal with those volatility um, and shocks, um, whether they, even if they are a bit more correlated, they'll still be able to be more diversified than your own production. Um, and also to deal with potentially large structural shifts where if we see massive movements of production into Canada um, and uh, Russia, uh, we, we're going to see a very, very different production of world, uh, production and trade uh, pattern. It would be very costly to try to resist that. So, so trade can yeah. be very important. I, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, a really Absolutely. good way to understand this, so complex, um, is a book by Rogers Rowe called The Last Hunger Season. And it talks about, it goes to a few families in Eastern Kenya who are going through a cycle of the hunger season and how it's repetitive and how climate change and, and, and trade and everything affect it. So it's a really good story for anyone you don't have to love agriculture. It's telling a human story. It actually has a second book that came back years after and followed these families. So I suggest anyone who'd like to know a little more about food security and all the aspects we talked about to check out Hunger Season. It is online. Unfortunately, I don't get paid for this infomercial, but it is a phenomenal book. Thanks, Julie. Uh, I think the benefit of being here, the panelists, the, the discuss and the presenter in the final session is, is you get to have the, the final thoughts on uh, uh, the broader theme of the, the symposium on agricultural productivity. So I want to ask a question. If you could put yourselves uh, in the same position you are now 10 years ago and, and thinking about how you might have presented or commented on this topic, really how has your thoughts about the future of productivity growth, how has that evolved? Over that last 10 years, have the risks shifted over the last uh, 10 years? And really, would your your, your comments uh, have changed over that time frame? Uh, so, uh, Gabe, I'll come to you first. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, 
you know, 10 years ago, as a plant breeder, I was thinking about environmental variability and environmental variation. And so to the background noise that you had to isolate out in order to make good measurements to advance the genetic value of a crop. Um, right now, it's the opposite. It's not the background noise. It's the dominating element that you can consider and be able to assess in order to make good choices on how to help the crop evolve towards adapting to that, that changing environment. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that the definition of environmental variation 10 years ago was a lot narrower uh, and a lot more uh, uh, predictable than what it is now. Uh, we start talking about much broader ranges of adaptation. Uh, we start talking about much faster cycles of change and evolution. And so that, that changes radically how the entire plant breeding industry is set up and, and, and operates. Gabe, thank you. Uh, Wolfram, do you care to comment on this? Uh, sure, briefly. So I, I think uh, what is going back to the first session that Phil mentioned, so I think even 10 years ago, it wasn't as clear to me how much of a, a leveling off of the productivity growth we've, we, we have sort of seen. So we don't have the exponential growth we used to have, which worries me a little bit. And I do feel that several factors are adding additional strain. One is like, the increase in sort of uh, uh, extreme heat. Uh, I think the reduction in public uh, uh, financing for basic research. Uh, so I would uh, uh, sort of lobby to sort of address those two. Thank you, Walter. And Will? Uh, yeah, I, uh, there are two things. One, I think on an analytical point of view, 10 years ago, we, were, we tended to look at what was happening to a country. Um, now we've got this fantastic um, methodologies for looking at household impacts and for looking at geographically, spatially disaggregated. So that's a terrific um, a bit increase in our ability to understand what's happening, to pick up phenomena like the cooling um, in the center of the Corn Belt that Wolfram mentioned. Another thing that's going to be very different, I think, looking forward is policy. I think mitigation you know, we're starting to see moves towards real policies on mitigation. They're going to have very big impacts. You know, the ozone layer issue, ozone, um, the surface ozone that Wolfram mentioned, I think 90% of agricultural emissions of greenhouse gases come from livestock and, and uh, methane, even more, um, uh, methane. So, um, Something is really likely to have to be done about that because that's huge. And that's the same order of magnitude as transportation in terms of creating the greenhouse gas problems that, that we're so concerned about. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And Julia, I definitely want to give you the, the final word here. I will be quick. I think we were really siloed as an industry 10 years ago and that we realized we can't do it alone. So we've opened up and it's going to take more than just agriculture. It's going to take... Um, every life science, every industry, um, changes in federal policies and, and beyond that for everyone. Just really see the change we want to see. So I'm glad to see we're looking at more holistic uh, solutions. Well, Julie, I appreciate that perspective. And I, I, I hope that this program serves as a part of that to convene a broader uh, conversation. So thank you all for your, your participation today and, and for the helpful insights that you all shared. So at this point, we're going to take a break before we move to the concluding discussion with Nate Kaufman. Um, if you would, please respond to the rating question that uh, appears on your screen for this session. Um, the concluding discussion is going to take place in about 15 minutes. So thank you all for joining us.